we're going to keep talking about multi-particle systems. And we'll first talk about um, motion relative to the center of mass and then probably get to angular momentum and total energy. But let's talk about the motion relative to the center of mass and then we'll do a two particle example, a pretty detailed example, but just with one degree of freedom. And that'll help illustrate some things. So unless there's um, unless there's any questions before we go ahead and begin. Is there anything? No? Okay. So this is motion relative to the center of mass. If you remember from uh, last time, I said that it's good practice to, uh, if possible, look at the motion in a frame where instead of some kind of random inertial origin, you use the center of mass as your origin. So you're looking in the center of mass frame. So I've got a figure of that somewhere. We're in week four already. My goodness. Okay, here we are. Here's the figure from somewhere in the book. I don't know where. I don't know why they left out B3. But this is the, whenever there's some other frame, the book usually calls it the B frame. So I'll just call it the B frame. So this is centered on the, the system center of mass. I'll sometimes abbreviate is just COM and it's also G. This frame is not rotating. So the B directions are parallel to these E frame directions. And this isn't necessarily an inertial frame. For it to be an inertial frame, the center of mass has to be moving at constant velocity. And we don't yet know that. But we can still do computations in this frame and write what's the position of particle I with respect to the center of mass. So this is position of mass MI with respect to G. And then if you write down Newton's laws, Newton's second law will end up looking like this. You could write the acceleration with respect to the B frame of mass I um, and on the right hand side here, so this is mass times acceleration with respect to the B frame is the external force on the on mass I. And, you know, who, who knows what that's due to? Maybe gravity, electric field or something. And then there's going to be forces due to all of the other particles. Uh, so like force on I due to J, this is like particle J. So we would sum over the effect of the, the forces due to all of the other particles, right? Those are called internal forces from last time. But then we have to subtract off um, the acceleration of the center of mass. So this was this part was on the left hand side, the mass times total acceleration, but we've decomposed the total acceleration to the acceleration of the center of mass and then acceleration of the particle with respect to the center of mass. So if we want to, we could we would call uh, these are these forces are real. And then this thing over here is not it's not a real force, it's sort of an artifact of using the center of mass as the center of our frame. So this might be called a inertial force. We'll come across a few things that are like inertial forces because it's convenient to describe the motion of the particle with respect to this frame. Now um, that acceleration will go away. This sort of goes back to last time. If the total, uh, total external force on the system 
and we called that you know f ext g if that is zero so there might be individual external forces on particles but if you sum them all up and that's zero then we have that the acceleration inertial acceleration of the center of mass is also zero and that means the uh, the b frame is also an inertial frame an inertial frame is something in a frame in which you can apply newton's laws and just for you know shorthand you think of it as it's a frame where right if the acceleration is zero that means it's um moving with constant velocity all right so we're going to apply this but not in like a full-blown 10 particle system. We'll look at a one dimensional example with two particles just to get us going. Okay, so this is just uh, it's a 1D kind of worked example with two particles. And here's the situation we've got um, some masses. These two, they've got two masses sliding on a surface. Let me sketch them out. There's M2, there's M1, and they're connected by a spring. So we just have, we've got two particles connected by a spring. They're sliding on a surface, but without friction. That's my dog whining in the background. It's all right. Um, we'll say that the spring constant is K. And the equilibrium length of the spring is L naught. So if we compress the distance between these two less than L naught, then the spring's going to push out. If we go greater than L naught, it's going to be restoring back in. Um, now let's set up a coordinate system. We're, we're only looking at motion in just the, on this line that kind of connects M1 and M2. So you might call that the X axis. It's, let's be more careful and call it the N1 direction. So N1 is the horizontal direction. N2 here is the, the vertical direction. This describes our inertial frame I. And we will measure the location of each particle. All we care about is the horizontal or let's call it the X direction of each particle. So this is X1. And up here, this is X2. The distance between the two instantaneously would be L. So L equals X2 minus X1. And that is, this is the, the length of the spring. <clears throat> now we wanna, we're gonna eventually wanna illustrate um, using the center of mass for this system. We won't, we won't do that yet. Let's um, let's right below this diagram. Let's put the free body diagram, we're, and we're only worrying about motion in the n1 direction. So don't worry about the normal force of the surface or anything. It's irrelevant right now. So we've got the the force on one due to two, and equal and opposite to that is the force on two due to one. Okay, and what is that force? force on one due to two, it's K. And then the, uh, right, X2 minus X1, that's the length of the spring minus the equilibrium length. And this will be negative F2, one. 
if we also write what's the position of our particles. So position of particle one with respect to O, if you want, it's this, I could draw it in here in orange, right? It's R one zero is just X one in the N one direction. R two with respect to the origin, it's X two, N one. Take two inertial derivatives, you get the inertial acceleration of particle one. It's just X one double dot N one. And for particle two, X two double dot in the N one direction. And now we've got everything we need to look at Newton's, just write out Newton's second law of motion for each mass. in just the N1 direction. So we'll get for mass M1, let's call it mass one, M1 X1 double dot, that's M A equals, and then what is F? F12, force on particle one due to two the only force that's acting. It's x2 minus x1 minus L naught. Okay, for mass two, m2 x2 double dot equals f2 one. It's just the negative of what we have above. So maybe let's call this first equation, equation one, second one, equation two. So we've got a, we've got two second order ODEs that we could solve for X1 and X2. But we don't want to do that. We're not using any of this machinery related to motion relative to the center of mass. So let's do that. So let's just suppose we're interested only in the relative motion, meaning the motion of these two particles relative to their center of mass. We can do that. And it should simplify things. And you might ask, why are we doing this? Um, because there is no total external force, we know ahead of time that if you were to get this two mass system moving in some direction, it's going to, the center of mass will move at a constant speed in that, in that direction. So the motion of the center of mass is very simple, or as people sometimes say, trivial. I don't like saying trivial, but. It's really simple. So the motion relative to the center of mass is kind of where the, the interesting stuff is happening. So we look at the, um, well, we first have to identify the center of mass and we know it's gonna be somewhere between these two masses. I don't know exactly where, let me just sort of sketch it in here. There's gonna be the location of the center of mass G. So how do we, uh, how do we find it? Well, we just, we, we know it's there somewhere. So we'll use the center of mass, um, like I said, to simplify since there are no external forces. And I'm gonna re-sketch what I have uh, up, up above, but kind of emphasizing the center of mass. So here's M1, here's M2. The center of mass is somewhere in between them. To simplify life, we will just at some point consider that these are equal masses. So here's G and we've got um, kind of a, all we care about is the X location of everything. Here's the, the origin O. Oops, don't want that. We've got the, 
center of mass has a location xg with respect to the the origin <clears throat> and then well like we did in the kind of diagrams up above we looked at what's the location of each particle with respect to the center of mass so particle 2 we'll call that r2 and positive is measured to the right m1 we'll call that little r r1 um, and if you're if you're worried about you know directions we'll say there's a there's a frame attached to g and it's got a b1 direction to b2 direction but they're in the same direction as n1 and n2 from up above then we'll use the we'll use the center of mass corollary i could write corollary so the center of mass corollary, that was just, you write the sum of the, this is basically just writing where is the location of the center of mass in the center of mass frame. So you write the sum R1, R2 plus M2, M1, R1, M2, R2, and that must equal zero because in the center of mass frame, the center of mass is at the origin. So just to, uh, to simplify things, we'll just assume we have equal masses. So M1 equals M2 equals M. If we have that, then this center of mass corollary implies that R2 equals negative R1. So all I have to do is solve for just one of the particles and then I pick up the other particle for free, what it's doing because what they're doing is, with respect to the center of mass, is just gonna be some mirror image. So we could, we could solve for the motion of M2 only. And then we could later, if we wanted to find out what R2 did, it'll be just the negative of um, what particle two did. So, okay. Um, well, let's get some other things in here. We'll probably need it. Because up above when we wrote the force, we wrote it in terms of X2 and X1. What is, here's X1 and then X2. We have X, one equals x g plus r1 and x2 equals x g plus r2 and we're going to need it later what is x2 minus x1 this is r2 minus r1 but from this expression up here, R2 is negative R1. We could write, also write this in, as two times R2. And two times R2, that is also L, the total length of the spring. Okay, let's, let's now write Newton's second law for mass two, but now using these locations relative to the center of mass. So we would say, this is, we're basically, let me just sneak up here. We're basically just rewriting this for particle two in our one dimensional problem where there's no external force. There's just the force due to the other particle. And this inertial force is gone because there's no total external force. So the center of mass is has zero acceleration. Well, so this is uh, using the formula above. What would we get? M times R2 double dot equals, and now it's just the force uh, on particle two so what was that? Negative 
k x2 minus x1 equals l and then subtract off the equilibrium length. So we just have that. Um, oh, we could write that as L or I guess we want to use our variables. So this is 2R2. Okay. And now let's rewrite in terms of L which is two R two. So R two double dot, this gives us M L double dot over two equals negative K L minus L naught. So that's a second order ODE that we could solve. We could make this ODE look even nicer if we, we see this L minus L naught, we could just define uh, we'll call it X and it's equal to L minus L naught. So this is, this X is just the stretch in the spring. And then X double dot equals L double dot because L naught is a, a constant. So then let me just rewrite what, how this simplifies, this becomes M x double dot over two equals negative k x double dot. No, not x double dot, x dot, just x. <clears throat> I like to have things so that we've got our second derivative on one side, x double dot equals, and then everything else. So if we write things that way, x double dot, uh, we have to move over the two and the M. So we get something that looks like that. And hopefully you can recognize that this just means, it just looks like simple harmonic motion. This is a simple linear second order ODE of the form x double dot equals negative a x where a is positive. So motion of x as a function of time is uh, sinusoidal. With the period um, of square root of a, we'll call that omega. Uh, frequency actually in radians per second. So what does that mean? That means the frequency is square root 2k over m. So we can, from this, so Simple harmonic motion means it's periodic in time and it's a sine or cosine function. So we can go ahead and even sketch what the motion looks like for X. Remember X is the stretch in the spring as a function of time. So this will go between um, a maximum and a minimum. I'll just sketch those two lines. And the plot will look something like, depending on, you know, how we released it, it'll, this is supposed to be like a sine function, but doing my best. So the distance between peaks, we'll call that uh, tau. Tau is the period of the motion. Right, so the period of oscillations is uh, tau, which in terms of omega is two pi over omega. So that's two pi over square root two k over m. And these points that I've written as x min and x max, maybe I'll 
bring these down here. So x max and x min are the terminology is they are turning points. If you notice what's happening to the the motion, the motion reaches x max and then it turns, and it goes to x min and then it turns. So they're called turning points of the motion. So we went from something where maybe it wasn't obvious, right? We could just, we could solve these two second order ODEs given initial conditions, but by looking in the center of mass frame, we could actually analytically figure out what the motion looks like. The stretch in the spring is sinusoidal. Um, so this two mass system is just sort of moving along, the center of mass moving at a straight line, constant speed, and relative to that, we have stretching. Um, oscillatory stretching, that's it. <clears throat> now, I wanted to also give you the point of view from looking at this in terms of energy, which is kind of a preview because we haven't said much about total energy or anything yet. But I'm going to rewrite this ODE, second order ODE, as uh, I'll move the mass back over to the left hand side. This is mx double dot equals, and I'm going to call this negative k bar x, where k bar is just defined to be 2k. It's twice the um, spring constant. Okay. So now this just looks like a, a spring, but let me introduce some energies. And we'll use capital T for kinetic energy. So the effective kinetic energy here is one half m x dot squared. Potential energy we'll write as capital U. Potential energy in a spring, a spring constant k bar is one half k bar, and then the stretch in the spring squared. So to remind us, T is the kinetic, is a kinetic energy, U is a potential energy. I want you to not worry about where these came from just yet. We'll talk about that later. Just say, okay, I'll, I'll buy it. This is the kinetic energy, this is the potential energy. It's only for the relative motion. We're not including kinetic energy due to the motion of the center of mass. This is just for relative motion. Then uh, I'll call this equation, equation star. The equation of motion star, it conserves the total energy. I'll call that capital E, which is kinetic plus potential. So T plus U. And then it's helpful to draw a sketch of energy as a function of the position. So we have our potential energy. The potential energy is, it looks like it's a, a parabola. It's opening up. We will write our constant energy or the total energy. So this is E, this blue curve I plotted was u and at any point in time like let's say we're at this point x the distance between e and u is t just from this expression up over here when t when we reach these points where the blue curve and the red curve meet the kinetic energy goes to zero Kinetic energy going to zero means that x dot goes to zero. We call that a turning point. 
So it'll be x max over here and over here, x min. So turning points are where the uh, potential energy curve meets the total energy and that's based on whatever the initial condition was right because t at any point in time t is one half m x dot squared so it's going to be maximum where these curves are furthest apart which is right here and then it's going to be minimum goes to zero when the curves meet and those are the turning points. So this is just an energy perspective that um, aligns with what's going on in the system. So we'll, we'll use this um, in other situations, but this is, this is just a graphical interpretation of the conservation of energy. And uh, this is in a one degree of freedom system, one DOF system, right? T equals zero, kinetic energy equals zero means that X dot equals zero. <clears throat> so turning points are sometimes called uh, zero velocity points. And those are points where like the acceleration is pointing one way when you get there and then it's pointing the other way as you leave it. And this analogy of, you know, this idea of turning points and zero velocity isn't just for one degree of freedom things. You could use this for n degree of freedom. Um, but just to say x dot, the velocity goes from positive to negative or vice versa. And that's why they're called turning points. The motion turns, okay? Um, so this was our example. We've kind of looked at a two spring or two mass system connected by a spring in one degree of freedom. I think later we'll look at in two degrees of freedom where things get more interesting but to discuss that we also we first need to discuss a couple of things the total angular momentum for the multiparticle system and then the total energy so this is sort of a preview of okay what's what are we going to do with energy what's the point you can interpret things from energy um, you could also verify that your simulation is correct using things like conservation of energy. But first, angular momentum. So total angular momentum of a system uh, of a multi-particle system. And this is in section 711 of the Kasdan and Paley book. I think I've got some diagram I want to use here. This one. All right. So we are looking at. Um, Say this particle I right there. So forces are external to the system. F I E X T. Um, let me just sort of draw that in. So here's an external force. Forces are ex external or internal. 
meaning there it's F I J force on I due to J. So this is due to particle J. Um, and we've already shown that for an example J. Here's the force on I due to J. Okay. And each particle has this. We can define the angular momentum. for particle i, it's the same as we used before for defining the angular momentum of a particle. We use little h and it's on i about our inertial origin. Remember, for total, I mean, for linear momentum, you don't have to refer to a specific point, but for angular momentum, you do. In this case, um, so this is the angular momentum for particle i about O, the origin O, and we write it as it's the mass times R I O, the position cross the inertial velocity. Really, it's the position cross the linear momentum, but we're writing the linear momentum as mass times inertial velocity. So we've got that. It's so the angular momentum of particle i. And if we were to write how this evolves in time, it evolves according to, you take its inertial derivative and work out what you get. You get a moment due to external forces. So we call that the external moment and a moment due to internal forces. So that's how it evolves. Um, and we could write what these are. So the external moment on particle I about O, uh, and these are, these are vectors. This is the moment arm. Um, so it's the location of the particle with respect to O cross the external force. And the internal moment, the particle I, is R I O cross, and we might write it this way, the total internal force on particle I. The total internal forces on particle I, this is the sum of the forces due to all the other particles. So we're summing over J. F I J. Okay. So you could, if you wanted to calculate how the angular momentum um, evolves for each particle, what's actually more useful most of the time is to consider the total angular momentum of the system and then find out how that evolves. So let me put a little dashed line here, the total angular momentum of the system you know, for this collection of particles that we have, we'll just write that as I, it's the inertial frame, H, um, H O. So it's the system, that's why there's no little I saying which particle. This is the sum of the individual angular momentum. So little i goes from one to n of the angular momentum vectors for each of these. So what is that gonna give us? It's going to give us a sum, the mass times the position across the inertial velocity of each particle. <clears throat> now, how does this evolve? This evolves, you to look at its total, the rate of change with respect to the inertial frame. We get the moment due to 
external forces. And then no moment due to internal forces because those will cancel out. Okay. So the moment due to external forces, this is the like the moment on the system. It's just the sum of the moments on each individual particle, external moments. But the key thing is there's no moment due to internal forces. However, an assumption was made that's often not told you. It often gets swept under the rug. And we don't even know if it's true. Um, no total internal moments. So it's, it's always good to know if you've made an assumption. And like I said, we don't even know if it's true, but there's something called the, uh, the internal moment assumption. It's a pretty big deal because if this assumption isn't true, you can't do rigid body dynamics. So it's probably true because rigid body dynamics seems to work pretty well. So this internal moments assumption is, is that F I J, the force between two particles is parallel to the line between them. And that's exactly how it was sketched up here. They sort of slipped that under the rug. There's, it's not necessarily required in general that the force between two particles be on the line between them. You could have equal and opposite forces and still have them, you know, not directed on the line between them. They could be at some kind of weird angle, but um, I guess, I guess that doesn't happen. So if we have like a particle I and a particle J, I mean, I don't think you have to stay up at nights worrying about this. So here's like location of particle I with respect to J. There's the vector. And we're just, we're assuming that the forces between them, so the force on J due to I and the force on uh, I due to J is, uh, it's along that same line. But I'm, you know, I'm telling you that you could, you could have a situation like this too. And the forces are both equal and opposite. But okay, this is probably a good assumption because if the forces in matter as we know it are related to uh, electrical charges, then it makes sense. It's gonna be directed on the line between the two. Think of the Coulomb force between two charged particles. It's directed on the line between the two. So this is probably okay. There may be certain exotic part, types of matter where this wouldn't hold and it's up to you to find it or something. Um, but if you make this internal moments assumption, then if we were to calculate just what's this internal moment, total in internal moment be the sum I from one to N of the individual internal moments which is sum from one to n the uh, particles cross and now we've got another sum j goes from one to n f i j so it will end up with a double sum will be a factor of one half and we're summing over I and J, R I slash J cross F I comma J. And since these two are parallel, according to our assumption, the cross, uh, this cross product is zero.
cross product is zero since these are parallel. If you're like, where's this factor of two come from? Well, I don't really have time. Just gotta look in the book. It, it works out. So this becomes a big giant zero. And I will say a note, you know, note, this might not be true. You often don't hear that in a rigorous mathematics class, but I'm just trying to be honest with you. In this class, we'll assume it's true for all intents and purposes, but I don't know, I could imagine, you know, magnetic forces are not directed on the line between two things. So, you know. Okay, so th this is this is very nice because it means for the whole system, all you have to do is consider external moments. And so if there weren't, if there aren't any external moments, that means that your system's angular, mo total angular momentum is constant throughout the motion. And you can use that at some point. Um, yeah, there's, there's something called the angular momentum separation. At least that's how the book refers to it. Maybe it's like an angular momentum uh, decomposition or something. I'm not sure why it calls it this, but you've got the angular momentum. This is the total angular momentum of the system about O equals the angular momentum of the center of mass about O plus the angular momentum of the system about the center of mass. What does all this mean? Let's make a little sketch of our, here's our collection of some particles. Um, the Milky Way galaxy, if you want. And then we've got the center of mass G and there's a bunch of particles, like here's a particle, there's particle I, here is R I respect to G. Um, it's got some velocity. And here's our inertial origin. So that's our inertial frame. This whole thing might be like swirling around, who knows. Um, we can decompose the, the total angular momentum this way. So yeah, I don't like separation. I would like the term decomposition. We've got this part, which is the thing we described above, the total angular momentum of the system about O, but right, O, at least as I've drawn it here, it's this sort of distant point, like who cares? Um, maybe what you care about is the angular momentum of the center of mass about O. And then what is this thing here? This is the angular momentum of the system about G. This is the main thing related to relative motion. In fact, this is what we'll use when we eventually get to rigid bodies. You, all you care about is the angular momentum of the system about its center of mass. It's kind of the, the easiest thing to, to deal with. Um, there are formulas also for, we've already written the formula for this first thing total angular momentum of the system about O, what about the other two? So the angular momentum of G, the center of mass about O is, it's just like you're writing it for a particle that you've labeled G. It's MG, so mass of the center of mass, which is the total mass. Position of G with respect to O, it's gonna be right, this thing, position of G with respect to O across the inertial velocity of G, whatever that is. 
and then the angular momentum of the system about G. It's just like you're writing the angular momentum of the system, but now using, instead of using the inertial origin O, you use G. So this is uh, mass times uh, position of each particle with respect to G cross the inertial velocity of that vector. So just for completeness, because this will come up later. Um, it'll especially come up when we, if we, you know, we've got our cloud of particles and now we just, we assume that they're all rigidly interconnected. So it's like we freeze them into place. Say, okay, you're locked together. That leads to a big simplification called rigid body dynamics. All right. So, got a, a little bit more theory. We talked about angular momentum and then making this internal moment assumption so that the, the evolution of the total angular momentum for a system equals only the moments due to the external forces. And a pretty reliable assumption there. Now we're gonna talk about the total energy of the multi-particle system. Um, yeah. And if you're worried about like, oh, we're not doing enough examples. Well, we did one and it took us about 20 minutes and we'll do another. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to get to it today, but it'd be like a two degree of freedom version of that spring mass system, um, which is very relevant for, I think it's homework problem two. And since I'm, while I'm writing this, let me just remind you, because this is the week before homeworks due, there'll be online only um, TA office hours Thursday between four and seven, uh, the links of the syllabus. And then they'll be in person on Monday. Okay, so the total energy of a multi-particle system, um, let me, I like my little sketches of here's a here's a triad of unit vectors. It's the inertial frame, uh, bunch of particles, kind of random. And well, it's not random enough. <clears throat> so here is like particle i, particle i, and we've got location of particle I respect to that inertial origin. Um, this thing is moving. So there's an inertial velocity of I with respect to our inertial origin. So we will, we can write the, uh, we'll write the individual kinetic energy of particle I, we'll write this as T I with respect to O. And this is one half mass times velocity squared, should be familiar to you. So one half mass, and then we'll write, uh, this is magnitude of the inertial velocity of particle O squared. Okay. The total kinetic energy of the system is just summing up all of these individual kinetic energies. And we'll write that as T sub O. So it's just the sum, I goes from one to N, T I O. Um, so it's the sum, one to n, 
one half m i inertial velocity of i with respect to o squared. That's our total kinetic energy. All right. Now, just like there was a separation or decomposition principle for the kinetic energy, there's a similar principle for, I mean, for the, sorry, for the angular momentum. There's a separation decomposition principle for the kinetic energy. Total kinetic energy. And it, you know, in terms of the symbols, it looks similar. T O equals T G with respect to O plus T G. Where uh, I'll write what T G is. T G is the sum from one to N. It's one half mass. And now we're looking at the inertial velocity of particle I with respect to G squared, which is going to be different. So here is uh, center of mass in this little sketch up here, here's G. Um, and I, I don't know, this is going somewhere. Here it is, inertial velocity of G with respect to O and um, this particle up here, I, will have some other velocity with respect to G. And that's what we're summing up here. One half M velocity with respect to the center of mass squared. I guess I should label these. Oh, it makes more sense. This is the total kinetic energy, Ke, of the system. What's this one? This is the kinetic energy of the center of mass with respect to O. And then Tg is the kinetic energy of the system with respect to G. If you want, this is the kinetic energy of relative motion, meaning motion relative to the center of mass. This one here is the kinetic energy of the center of mass. This will be related to translational motion of the entire system. This will be related to relative motion, which um, could be all kinds of things, could be due to like swirling, rotation, things moving every which way. Once we go to just rigid body dynamics, we make the kind of rigidity assumption that all the particles are locked together. The only type of relative motion with respect to the center of mass is rotational motion. But we haven't made that assumption yet. So, okay, this is um, up here, Tg kinetic energy of the system with respect to G. What is T G O is it's like writing the kinetic energy for the center of mass as if it were a particle. So it's one half Mg, which is the total mass times the inertial velocity of the center of mass. So there we go. That's kinetic energy, let me put that up here. So we've talked about kinetic energy. Now we need to talk about potential energy because some forces come from potential energies or you could write them as coming from potential energies. Okay, so we've done Ke, now we do Pe, potential energy. This is, when you have a potential energy, that means that you have a force that comes from a potential energy. These are sometimes called conservative forces. 
I would rather just say forces that come from a potential energy, but because they're not always conserved. Uh, all right, my little sketch again of the situation, origin O, particles on particle uh, I here, we have the external force on particle I. Then we've got the force due to all of the other particles. So let's write the external force first. The external force can be decomposed into those which come from a potential energy. In other words, conservative forces. Let me move this up here. And forces that are not conservative. So I will write it this way. And up in this parentheses, we'll put C comma EXT. So conservative external forces plus NC, non-conservative external forces. And also the uh, force on particle I due to particle J can be decomposed the same way. It'd be conservative force on I due to J plus a non-conservative force. Yeah, this doesn't have external next to it. I due to J. So all of these in this first category, these are from conservative forces. And these others are from non conservative forces. A conservative force would be something like due to a charged particle, like a Coulomb force or gravity or uh, elasticity, like the stretch in a spring. There's others. Non-conservative force would be things like friction um, or just anything that you don't know where it comes from. If you work in the area of control, control forces, like control torques and control um, thrust, uh, usually when you write those, you treat those like they're non-conservative forces because it's not like they follow this rule of coming from a potential energy. And okay, well, what do I mean coming from a potential energy? This, hopefully you've seen something like this before, but the, um, forces that come from a potential energy. So let's start with the external force that comes from a potential energy. It looks like the negative of a gradient of a potential energy function. So that's what this capital U is. Capital U external. This is I mean, one of the key things is it's a force that comes from the gradient of a scalar function, meaning just it takes a value at each point in space. So this is a scalar function of 3D space. And um, what about F I due to J conservative? That is the negative gradient. So this gradient operator, right? It takes a scalar and it gets the three vector components. So nature is nice in that uh, many forces are conservative forces and they are easier to deal with. And they contribute to conservation of energy. So UIJ, this is another, right? There's like, depending on how large your system is, there's zillions of these scalar functions. And 
And why is this a big deal? Well, kinetic energy is also a scalar function. So you can add scalar functions and you'll get the total energy. Total energy uh, for the multi-particle system. The book writes it this way, E O is T O, kinetic energy, total kinetic energy, plus the total external potential energy plus the total internal potential energy. And you could probably guess where the, what these things are. The total external potential energy is just the sum, one to n, of the external uh, potential, the external potential energies on I due to O, and the internal potential energy. So this is the, the total external potential energy. This one is, this one half is so that we don't double count. It's the same from up above because between any two particles, um, you would have the, the same potential ij. So we're just trying to avoid double counting. So i goes from one to n, j goes from one to n, u, i, j. Okay. So we got those. This is the total internal. Why is it called internal? Because it's due to other particles that are in the system, internal to the system. Okay. Now, if um, if the only forces causing motion are from potential energies, in other words, our conservative forces, then the total energy, my dog wants me to take him outside. You have to wait a few minutes. Uh, the total energy is E sub O is conserved. And that's where we get this term conservative forces. That means it is a constant of motion. That means that whatever it is at some time is what it had uh, at some initial time. And this could be very useful because the, the kinetic energy could change wildly and the potential energy changes wildly. But as long as everything is just, all the motion is due to a potential energy, then the sum of those must be a constant. And that's, you're asked to evaluate that at least for homework one. Um, and then you could also use this principle uh, for homework problem two. So, you know, what does this mean? If we're just looking at energy over time, you might have that the kinetic energy does crazy things. And then the potential energy does crazy things. Um, I don't know, something. But the sum of those two will be a constant. And this is just a schematic 